Now, fabric has no form unto itself. Take a piece of material and lay it flat on the floor. It'll lie there quite silent, quite smooth, quite dead. Pull it by one corner, and all of a sudden, it comes alive. It's a system of radiating lines. Now, the textile and the weave affect the bulk, resilience, and stiffness of the fabric. Wrinkle systems follow that flow of action as they manifest flexion, compression, friction drag forces. Tension lines come from anchor points, such as our limbs, our joints, our waist, as we extend, bend, and twist and turn. So these lines are not the distances between points, but points are the intersection of lines. And all of this design, all of these lines, represent our past and our present actions. This movement across space is described by Kash as a creative multiplicity and the fold as a model for that unexpected movement. It's a design without destiny, no center, no boundaries, no meaning, just a surface of gravitational vectors, highs and lows. It's also described as a landscape, hills and valleys, constantly moving as they map the wearer's life space. Well, this is real clothing, clothing as worn. But in art history and in visual culture, there's also what is called represented clothing, clothing with a focus on design and display. And that brings us to fashion. Now, fashion is profound in its superficiality. The fashion system knows no depths, only the play of surfaces. As Taylor describes, artificial, frivolous, fickle, sensuous, superfluous. In its subversion of all that is enduring and classical, the anchor points appear and disappear. The tension lines slip and slide and the wearer's body gets lost under that play of signifiers. It is an ephemeral narrative, written with dots, dashes, flowing lines, variable curvatures, and hills and valleys. Now, the Baroque has always been synonymous with the fold. It is recognized in the textile model where the fabric frees itself from its usual subordination to the body underneath. According to Deleuze, if there is inherently a bro costume, this is it. Broad, billowing, flaring, constantly multiplying, never betraying the body beneath. But the Baroque is much more than just a costume. The Baroque radiates in the thousand folds that overwhelm the wearer's life space. And as in this portrait, of Madame de Pompadour, all those folds make her head look like that of a swimmer bobbing atop of a sea of waves. Those waves represent rolling motion. And when you have many similar waves, that's repetition. But when the waves intersect, they crests are forming, continually moving, impossible to stop. So the question is, what does all this mean? Reminiscent of Freud's language of symbolism, there's often a rupture between the appearance of things and their meaning. While real clothing is burdened with practical considerations, covering the body for modesty, protecting the body from the elements, and adorning the body according to socially constructed fashion norms, Clothing also serves as our indexical relation between the ego and the outside world, between our inner self and our surface, and between our personhood and external objecthoods. So akin to Stafford's discussion of 19th century marbleized paper patterns, to strave, rove, and ramble 
becomes a symbol of revolt because it leads one away from the straight line, the straight path into those dark recesses, into those deep voids where sin, blunder, and mistake reign. But to err is to be human. Isn't life about getting swallowed up, overrun by the waves of daily reality? Isn't this the physical, metaphysical nature of our being in the world? Okay, so we'll do some Shakespeare. Everybody knows Hamlet, right? Everybody knows Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of wrinkles and by ironing end them. So should we get out the iron? Should we smoothen out those wrinkles and starch the fabric? Do we prefer the tabula rasa, the clean slate, the erasure of all of our past and present actions? When the pure geometry and finite constructs of Euclid and Pythagoras fall apart, when all of their isosceles triangles, right triangles, the segments, the parallelograms, the areas, all of those things finally atomize and disappear, all that will be left in this world will be irregularities and wrinkles. And only then will we be able to find our own personal individual geometries and our own authentic self and use those to write the narratives on the surfaces of our bodies. Let's do another example. This is Bernini's statue of Ludovica Albertoni. She was a Renaissance noblewoman, very well known for her dedication to the poor. She's also very well known for her spiritual ecstasies. Now when Winkelmann and Doy look at the sculpture, they ask, what is that surface? Is it fabric? Is it skin? Is it emotion? A surface for the inscription of pathos. And then what about the marble? The coloration, the veining, the lines, all of that visually vibrates together. And depending on where you're standing, and depending on how the light is falling on the sculpture, coloristically, sculpturally, it looks like it's changing, it's moving, the folds are continually varying. Now we enter the realm where forms communicate movements of the mind, a basic concept of vector psychology. And it's not just one moment, one movement, it's multiple moments, multiple movements that very well represent Ludovica's interior spiritual awarenesses, her psychic revelations, her impassioned inner being. Now in topological field theory, tension systems reveal a lot about our psychic events, our experiences, and our behaviors. It is a permissive, libertine, diagonal, a dynamic, slippery, subversive, cascading dialogue that characterizes our being in the world as perpetually in a state of evolving, involving, devolving, enveloping, enveloping, developing. So if all of this represents our past and our present, is there any meaning here for our future? When the topological field folds over and unto itself, multiple points of intersection are possible far into the Z dimension. When Deleuze says that each of us are multiple or plural, he doesn't mean that we are many things or that we have many egos, but that we are folded in many irregular and entangled ways. A multiplicity far beyond what we could ever perceive a multiplicity far beyond what we could ever predict. So here we have Loie Fuller, and Loie Fuller is performing her improvisational serpentine dance of the scarves. 
The fabric follows the movements of her body, follows the movements of her mind. The fabric functions as her interface with the world, with the sunlight, with the air, with the wind, with the environment. And as she pulls and tugs and flips that fabric around, she demonstrates that all is fluid. Everything is folding, unfolding. Nothing is static, structured, or starched. So consciously or unconsciously, we're always writing narratives on our body for the world to see. The issue is, does anybody else know how to read your own authentic vocabulary? Read between those lines and read deep within to those folds and into those recesses. So generally, these TEDx talks end with the speaker giving you a bit of advice. So what could I possibly say? Throw out the iron, put on the old shirt, move around a lot, look at all the wrinkles, folds, and creases, and wear that shirt as a badge of honor for a life fully lived. Thank you.